Hello, everyone. On behalf of FSG, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, What Makes Evaluating Complexity Different? Thank you so much for joining us in this webinar, which discusses the nine propositions from Evaluating Complexity, a practice brief published by FSG last fall. My name is Hallie Preskill, and I am a Managing Director leading FSG's strategic learning and evaluation work, and one of the author authors of Evaluating Complexity. We have a terrific program for you today with a tremendous group of speakers. Next slide, please. But before I get started, I want to touch on a few items. Today's program is 60 minutes long, and you are encouraged to submit written questions and comments at any time during the presentation. Next slide, please. Click on the general chat tab at the bottom of your screen Type your question in the box at the bottom of that space and then click Send. Your questions are only visible to the presenters, and the presenters will verbally respond to as many questions as time allows. At the conclusion of today's presentation, you'll be redirected to an online evaluation form. Please take a moment to complete the evaluation. We truly value your feedback. If you need technical assistance during the webinar, please call KRM Support at 1-800-775-7654. Today's slides will be available following the presentation at FSG, but they're also available to you now. When you got your information yesterday about connecting uh, to this webinar, we also included a link to the uh, webinar slides. So you can access those anytime if you haven't already uh, during the, the uh, webinar or certainly afterwards. Next slide, please. First, I'm going to kick things off with a bit of an overview of what it means to evaluate complexity and briefly describe nine propositions for evaluating complex initiatives or initiatives that live in complex environments. We will then hear from two sets of panelists who will share their experiences applying a complexity lens to their work. After each presentation, we will invite the panelists to answer one or two clarifying questions about their work. We'll give that about three minutes. After both presentations, we will then open it up to a general Q&A session. We're hoping to have about 15 to 17 minutes for this. We will be tracking your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll do our very best to address some of the major themes that emerge. So let's get started. Next slide, please. I've been in the evaluation field a really long time, and over the years, I have consistently heard the statement, you can't evaluate that. I used to think it was a comment regarding the difficulty of collecting quantitative data. But now I really wonder if this is a statement more in reaction to the challenges of evaluating complex initiatives or initiatives that are in complex environments. That is, we can easily feel overwhelmed when thinking about how messy our initiatives are, how fast things change in our work and communities, how many people are involved, and so on. It, it's, it gets dizzying. Well, in an effort to ground our panelists' presentations, I thought I would first ask you to think about whether your work is complex. If the majority of your answers to these questions are yes, then traditional approaches to program evaluation may not be sufficient and or adequate. So let's consider these questions. Think about an initiative or program um, or um, an intervention you're working with and ask yourself, are there many components or parts? Is the issue you're working on related to other issues or problems? Is the context continuously changing? For example, the culture, economy, politics, demographics. Are relationships important to the success of your initiative? Do things change just as you thought you've gotten a handle on them? Is there a straight path from implementation to outcomes? Are the outcomes predictable? Is it taking place in multiple locations? Are many individuals and organizations involved across different sectors? Are there different definitions of what success is? Are all the outcomes known or knowable? Next slide, please. In the last few years, you've likely heard reference to a set of definitions that suggest that if your problem is simple, it's like baking a cake. If it's complicated, it's like sending a rocket to the moon. And if it's complex, it's like raising a child. If you found yourself answering the preceding set of questions with lots of yeses, and you often find it difficult to know just what to measure, then you're living in complexity, which is characterized by, next slide, please. Oh, excuse me, no, <laughs> sorry. By, um, high uncertainty and high social conflict, where the outcomes and interventions aimed at solving problems are unpredictable. You, you have many factors and variables that are interacting, and many of them are not only unknown but unknowable. So there can't be a recipe for success. And just to add a little bit more clarity about complexity, next slide, please. We have to act differently to address complex problems. 
Because the path from implementation to success is not linear, because relationships grow and evolve and change, because changing one thing in a system can create unexpected consequences, and because context very much matters, we need a different way to evaluate complexity. Next slide, please. So to help those planning and designing evaluations, we've developed the following nine propositions that are outlined in much more detail in our practice brief available on the FSD website. And I'd like to just go through these and have you just kind of listen and take these in while you look at them on the screen to think about the extent to which your, your evaluations that you've been supporting are encapsulating and reflecting these different nine propositions and to think about how practical and useful they may be in evaluating complex interventions. So the first one, design and implement evaluations to be adaptive, flexible, and iterative. Number two, seek to understand and describe the whole system, including the components and connections. Three, support the learning capacity of the system by strengthening feedback loops and improving access to information. Four, pay particular attention to context and be responsive to changes as they occur in that system. Five, look for effective principles of, action, of practice and action rather than assessing adherence to a predetermined set of activities. Six, identify points of energy and influence as well as the ways in which momentum and power flow within the system. Seven, focus on the nature of relationships and the interdependencies within the system. Eight, explain the nonlinear and multidirectional relationships between the initiative and its intended and unintended outcomes. And nine, watch for patterns, both one-off and repeating, at different levels of the system. Our hope is that these propositions help bring more clarity and confidence in navigating the ways in which evaluations can take into account the complexity of initiatives and their environment. Thus, complexity is not a problem to be solved. Rather, it is really something to be embraced as a source of innovation and adaptability that's supported by diversity and distributed problem solving. So in truth, complexity is really a good thing. We just need to get better skilled at expecting, seeing, and responding to the surprises that our interventions, our initiatives, present us with on a daily basis. Next slide, please. So now, let's hear more about how these propositions have been used in evaluation practice. Our first set of panelists are Chris Cutsley, who works with the Grand Rapids Community Foundation and is co-director of the Challenge Scholars Initiative. Her responsibilities include program development and evaluation. And we'll hear from Shriek Gopal, the director who lead, co-leads FSG's strategic learning and evaluation practice and works across a, a wide variety of evaluation engagements. Over to you, Chris. Thanks so much, Hallie. If you could go to the next slide, please. The Challenge Scholars Initiative is the most ambitious and complex effort ever undertaken by the Grand Rapids Community Foundation. We began developing the concept in 2009 in response to a priority set by our board to increase the number of first-generation, low-income students who successfully obtain a degree or a high-quality credential. But the initiative, is, the initiative is led by the Community Foundation in partnership with Grand Rapids Public Schools. The in, at, the issue of educational attainment is connected to many systems, and our approach is holistic. As a result, multiple stakeholders are engaged with the work, including local colleges and universities, community-based organizations, and business. The program design of Challenge Scholars is also multifaceted. A key component is the promise of a scholarship for a free college education. The scholarship addresses the perception by most of our students and families that college is simply unaffordable. But the real work and what sets Challenge Scholars apart from many promised programs is ensuring that students are well situated to take full advantage of the opportunity that the scholarship offers. We're achieving this by providing additional supports to students and families beginning in sixth grade. First, students' most basic needs are met through a community school model that brings behavioral health, physical health, and human services into the school buildings. We're also preparing students academically by providing instructional coaches and a data specialist who work to build teacher capacity. This aligns with district level efforts to improve instruction. The students' college and career aspirations are reinforced through exposure to career pathways and the creation of a strong college-going culture within the schools. 
And finally, we engage with families around students' academic success by building relationships with parents and equipping them to be full partners on this journey. Next slide, please. Because of the complex nature of Challenge Scholars, its evaluation could have gone in many directions. But leaders from the Community Foundation and the public schools worked together to design the evaluation questions you see here. We determined that these questions were critical to understanding both how the initiative was developing and to informing its success. You will likely notice the focus here is not on impact. These questions don't seek to quantify change, measure outcomes, or attribute success or failure. There are very different themes to these questions, themes that are particularly appropriate to the early stages of this initiative. For example, we were interested in learning the ways in which different stakeholders are experiencing and understanding challenge scholars. We also want to learn if and how challenge scholars is influencing the family, the school, and the community. By asking these types of questions, we are better equipped to shape the Challenge Scholars Initiative as it evolves in response to new and sometimes unexpected realities. The evaluation findings serve as intelligence that help us respond strategically to those realities. Shriek leads the evaluation team, so I'll turn it over to him to reflect on the propositions. Thank you, Chris. Uh, hi, folks. This is uh, Shriek Gopal. And I'll now talk about uh, how two of the nine propositions that, that Hallie outlined were put into practice while evaluating challenge scholars. Proposition one, as you may recall, is about the evaluation being flexible, adaptive, and iterative. In the case of challenge scholars, this applied both to the evaluation design and to the evaluation implementation. The evaluation plan was co-created with a group of key stakeholders including the leadership of the two main organizations involved, i.e. the community foundation and the school district. The evaluators walked the stakeholders through a structured process of defining the initiative and its intended outcomes, crafting evaluation questions that you saw on the previous slide, and creating a plan for data collection, analysis, and co-interpretation. While the evaluation plan laid out a broad sequence of steps over the course of the year. We were also flexible in making changes as needed. Data collection methods and sources were prioritized based on real-time client needs. For example, midpoint through the year, focus groups with parents revealed low awareness of challenge scholars initiative among parents. When this information was brought to the program leaders, they suggested that the evaluators dig deeper into this issue to understand the root causes and help come up with better strategies for engaging parents. Consequently, uh, we conducted additional interviews and a literature review, and based on that analysis, suggested ways to reach harder to reach parents, including the increased use of local churches, community elders, and community-based organizations. Next slide, please. Proposition two is about describing the whole system including components and connections. A key tool we used in doing this was systems mapping. Now, there are several types of systems maps out there. The one we used here is what I refer to as an actors and roles map that essentially showed who the key actors were, how they were connected, and what their main roles were when it came to challenge scholars. One of the questions that comes up when we talk about this proposition is what the phrase, quote, unquote, whole system really means. We recognize that it's impossible to capture every component and nuance of the system. Hence, our approach is to capture the 80 to 90 percent of system dynamics that really matter for a particular initiative. With Challenge Scholars, it was important for us to capture the roles of six major actors, the community foundation, the school district, individual schools, parents and families, higher education, and the community at large. The systems map helped to guide and focus the evaluation by defining the boundaries of the initiative and by illuminating the connections. However, as you can see on the slide, the systems mapping process itself was iterative. The map was revised multiple times 
So we got to a version that stakeholders felt com comfortable with for the first year of the evaluation. We then revisited again at the end of year one, informed by the findings from that first year, and created a slightly modified version that served to guide the evaluation for the next year. Next slide, please. There were a few key lessons learned in evaluating a complex, multifaceted initiative like Challenge Scholars. One is that co-creation iteration is not something you do once with stakeholders. Instead, they form the basis of how the evaluation is conceptualized, designed, and implemented throughout the process. The second lesson is that evaluators have to constantly find ways to have an ear to the ground in terms of what was happening with the context of challenge scholars. This meant regular conversation with program leaders to get updates on the latest events and happenings, following the social, me social media feeds of the foundation, the school district, and local media organizations, checking in with frontline staff as, as often as possible. This allowed us, the evaluators, to be nimble and responsive to the client's needs. Lastly, it's hard to overstate the need to build trust between the evaluators and the program team when it comes to complex initiatives. With Challenge Scholars, trust was a key factor in ensuring that evaluation findings were received and acted on in meaningful ways. However, this is something that all three key partners, i.e. the evaluators, the community foundation, and the school district, are continuing to work on. Now, I'll pass it back to Chris for her reflections on the lessons learned. Thanks, Shriek. The first lesson in particular really resonates because it relates to the critical issue of partnership health. The Community Foundation and the school district represent very different organizational cultures. So for our team, the experiences of co-creating, iterating, rinsing and repeating have been essential. Early in our evaluation work, the experience created buy-in from all members of the team. These practices also clearly demonstrated that the Community Foundation wanted a real, authentic partnership with the district and firmly established the evaluation team in their role as learning partner. These practices continue to help the team build trust and our capacity to work better together. There's no question that our evaluation experience is strengthening our partnership muscle. Well, thank you, I, um, Chris and Tariq, very, very much. Uh, this is Hallie again. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we've invited the panelists um, to respond to one or more clarifying questions um, about their presentation. And thank you, uh, participants. You've provided some really good, juicy uh, questions for Chris and uh, Shriek. So we do have a few, luckily, thank you for keeping your, your presentation on time as well. Um, so let's see, uh, the first one, let's go with the more specific than to the more general. Um, to both of you, um, folks are asking some questions about the systems mapping exercise. And can you talk a little bit more about the methods used or was there a particular approach to systems mapping you used? Um, so Chris or Shri, could, could you address that in a, just a minute or two? Yeah, thanks, Sally. This is Shriek. So, uh, and I kind of refer to it as an actors and roles type of map. I mean, there are other systems map that look at, you know, causal loop diagrams, for instance, or kind of stock and flow diagrams. This is a pretty simple version that really just looked at who the key actors were, how those actors were connected, what were the sort of key connections between them, and what, their, what, what were their main roles when it came to implementing this initiative. And the way the map was devo developed, as I mentioned, was through an iterative process. So we had a key group of stakeholders, uh, including folks from the foundation and the school district, uh, as part of this kind of working group that we uh, worked with in the evaluation. And we uh, essentially put them through a process. It took a few meetings, and as you saw, it kind of evolved over time. Uh, and the process essentially kind of asked these questions, you know, who are the major actors, how are they connected, what are their roles? And we used, you know, pretty much uh, old technology, post-its, flip charts, markers. Uh, you know, the, the room was just kind of covered with uh, lots of arrows and, and post-its and, and, and uh, you know, flip charts. But we really tried to kind of map out what the system really is, define the boundaries and, and, and characteristics of the system that we're actually evaluating. 
uh, and as simple as that may sound, it had actually not been done before in the initiative. So it was immensely clarifying for folks to say, okay, this is what we're really talking about. We now have a shared understanding of who the system is, who the players are, what the connections are, that then enables us to actually ask some of these evaluation questions. Uh, and the last thing I'd say is, you know, there are some technology tools uh, now available for Systems Map if folks are interested in doing more kind of complex, uh, more um, Systems Map with more players. There's one called Kumu that we've been using uh, fairly recently, but there are tools out there if folks are interested in, in, in really sort of, you know, uh, using this tool to its full potential. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Shri. Hey, Chris, there's a question that um, I think some folks would love to hear from you, uh, your answer. And the question is, how has the Challenge Scholars Initiative evolved as a result of this particular approach to evaluation? What has it enabled you to think about or do differently than, say, a more traditional approach might be? Sure. Yeah. You know, I, I think really the, the evaluation has led us to be far more responsive. So, for example, in, in response to evaluation findings regarding parents, we are adopting a much more personalized, relational approach to family engagement. Um, in, you know, as another example, based on what we were hearing from the higher ed community and community-based organizations, we're developing a more clearly articulated process for engagement. Um, the evaluation has even informed uh, more less strategic and more tactical decisions. So, um, again, it, it as an example, parents were expressing anxiety about eventually sending their children to the neighborhood high school. To them, it was very unfamiliar, kind of foreboding. They didn't know the staff. So in response to that, um, the high school principals now attend parent meetings at the middle school and, and elementary schools, and we're holding our large annual celebration at the high school this year to give parents the opportunity to be in, in the space and meet the staff. Um, so, you know, without the evaluation in this approach, uh, I think these might have all been missed opportunities um, simply because they might not quite have made it onto our radar. Great. Thank you, Chris, very, very much. Um, maybe one other question. Uh, somebody did ask about how uh, to spell KUMU, the, the uh, tool that Shriek referenced. It's K-U-M-U. K-U-M is in Mary U. Um, in terms of another, maybe one more question. Um, let's see. Oh, there were some questions about, about uh, the, from the systems map, folks are wondering kind of what did that enable you to do beyond the, the map in terms of methodology or to, how did it help you kind of design the evaluation going forward? Was there a connection there between the systems map and how you actually implemented the evaluation or designed it from there? Yeah, I think um, this is Shrek. One of the things that helped us do is that it's kind of think about the boundaries of the evaluation and then it, it led to them thinking about um, you know, what changes we expect in the system over time, which then led to the creation of those evaluation and learning questions. Um, so we, if you look back at those questions, those are about the different players and how they're evolving over time. And as we've got data uh, to answer those questions and they, as we brought that data back, it actually then changed how the systems map looked. So if you sort of put the systems map from year one and year two side by side, uh, kind of like spot the six differences. There are a few differences that are notable. Uh, for example, some of the activities that were highlighted in year one uh, were decided, it was decided that they were no longer important for the evaluation to look at in year two, whereas there were some other uh, activities and roles of some players that became more important. For example, the roles of community organizations, higher education institutions, and businesses became more important in year two. So it kind of was an interplay between, you know, the, the systems map, the evaluation, questions and the actual data. All right, thanks, Rick. Again, thank you all for, um, uh, Chris and Rick for answering the questions for your presentation and panel, uh, excuse me, participants, you're asking some great questions and very juicy questions and, and quite robust. So um, we'll save a lot of these questions for the general Q&A at the, at the end because there are more, some of them more general. Uh, but of course, you all can follow up with uh, Chris and Shriek after the webinar too if you have more specific questions for them. So let's go ahead and transition now to our second pa pair of panelists. Um, if we could go to the slide, um, there we go, thank you. Um, so our next pair of panelists are Mona Jawar, who is Evaluation Manager at the California Endowment, 
and Caitlin Mack, an Associate Director in FSG's San Francisco office, and who, and who has broad experiences evaluating complex initiatives in health, education, and community development. Mona, I'm handing it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Holly. Can we move to the next slide? Thank you. All right, so the California Endowment is starting year five of our 10-year commitment to building healthy communities, where we're striving to create policy and systems change across the state by coupling statewide policy work, or the efforts of our Healthy California team, with a place-based approach, or the efforts of our Healthy Communities team. Our place-based work focuses on 14 high-opportunity communities across California that are culturally and racially diverse. Over half of our residents are non-English speaking and a majority of our residents are from communities of color. It should be no surprise then that what undergirds our work is a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that this translates to the endowment not shying away from addressing policies or practices imbued in structural racism and inequity that lead to higher rates of incarceration, school dropout, and healthcare access challenges that disproportionately impact the communities we're focusing on, including our young men and boys of color. With this in mind, the efforts of both of our Healthy California and Healthy Communities teams fall into three campaigns. Health Happens in Schools, where we're focusing on issues such as promoting social and emotional support for students. Health Happens with Prevention, where we're focusing on the implementation of the Affordable Care Act and health happens in neighborhoods where we're focusing on a variety of issues ranging from land use to safety. To move work within these campaigns, we're also strengthening the existing capacities of communities in five areas that we refer to as the drivers of change. The drivers include a focus on collaboration, youth leadership and development, building the power of residents, leveraging partnerships, and changing the narrative to build an understanding of the need to go beyond the medical model to promote health. Our theory is that as we strengthen the capacities of our partners around these drivers, our partners will be able to, or continue to, produce policy and systems change, both statewide and locally, that will bring about lasting community change. Next slide, please. So given our interest as a foundation in continuous learning, we partnered with FSG to conduct an external assessment or a strategic review of building healthy communities that would allow us to step back and reflect on our work about a third of the way through BHC. We were interested in using the findings from the review to help us strengthen and improve our efforts overall. The strategic review addressed the questions that are listed here on your screen and we wanted to look at the degree to which our own structures and processes helped or hindered BHC, how our internal teams were aligning, what was helping to promote or hinder power building, how structures promoted partnerships and community capacity building, and finally, we wanted to look at the change being created. Ultimately, these questions really reflect the key assumptions that underline the BHC strategy and our theory of change. Now I'll go ahead and pass it to Caitlin to share some of the principles in practice. Thanks so much, Mona. Next slide, please. So today I want to share how two of the propositions were put into practice while evaluating building healthy communities. Proposition number four is about paying particular attention to the context of the initiative and being responsive to changes as they occur. And when we talk about understanding context, we really are seeking to understand a few things. We want to understand the characteristics of the people and the setting of the initiative. We want to understand the economic environment, the way in which organizations and institutions interact with one another. And of course, when we're talking about policy and systems change, we'd like to understand the political dynamics of a place. We chose case studies as a primary way to pay attention to context. Uh, through two in-depth case studies, one in the work in Sacramento and the other in Santa Ana, we conducted interviews with community members, both adults and youth, in two of the Building Healthy Communities places, and we interviewed nonprofit leaders and public officials there. We spent a week on the ground in the two communities we were studying, attending community meetings, 
and talking with residents informally. And perhaps most importantly, we interacted frequently with local researchers who had been part of the initiatives since the very start. They provided us with critical context and grounding for the initiative, um, and they also, uh, you know, they, they also provided us with input into our evaluation questions um, and helped us in framing our findings. Admittedly, our time on the ground was short, yet even spending a few days in the places where the work was happening really helped give our evaluation team a better sense of the setting in which the initiative was taking place. The relevance of these case studies went beyond just the places we studied. They really helped to deepen our understanding of why we were seeing certain patterns and trends in the progress of the initiative overall. Next slide, please. The next proposition, Proposition 5, is about looking for effective principles of practice and action. Many program evaluations are designed to assess fidelity to a particular model. And in these cases, you can sort of utilize a checkbox style evaluation approach. But with Building Healthy Communities, there wasn't a model or a predetermined set of activities to assess implementation against. Instead, our evaluation sought to identify and explain what you might call simple rules that were alive in the work. And this led us to ask different kinds of questions as we were going about the evaluation. So one of the topics we looked at was cross-sector collaboration. And on that topic of collaboration, we sought to answer a question like, how are collaboratives structured in ways that contribute to policy and systems change um, rather than asking, do the, collaborative, do the collaboratives adhere to a certain set of criteria or requirements that the foundation has laid out? And this was really important to us and to the foundation because each community collaborative was different by design. It was intentional. Early on, the foundation outlined some general principles for the collaboratives, such as having cross-sector stakeholder participation, including resident and youth voices, and in light of those, those underlying principles, communities were expected to adapt and implement these according to their unique context. And we knew a survey wouldn't provide the depth of detail or context for us to know how or why collaboratives were contributing to policy change. So rather than going down that route, we conducted focus groups with collaborative organizers, and we interviewed people who were involved in the collaboratives, and we spoke with place-based program managers at the endowment. And so by looking at this data from multiple perspectives, we were able to develop a set of conclusions about what effective local collaboration looks like for the initiative. And so, for example, one of the, the principles of practice that we really learned more about was that the collaboratives which had married planning with action were better off than those whose main purpose uh, was visioning and process alone, and that the creation of, of action campaigns was particularly important to sustaining the engagement of residents and youth, which was an important ingredient in the Building Healthy Communities work. Next slide, please. So that brings us to what we've learned. One of the things that we've learned is that evaluating complexity really does require the inclusion of diverse voices and perspectives in the design and implementation of the evaluation. Uh, program staff who were close to the work that was happening in the 14 places helped us to identify the key evaluation questions we sought to answer. And we also included grantees in the planning and design of the evaluation through a set of interviews that we conducted to identify what those evaluation questions might be at the outset. Um, also, in planning the community case studies, we engaged community leaders and local researchers who could make sure that the questions and the findings were relevant and could be used by both the local stakeholders as well as the endowment. Uh, the second thing we learned was that evaluating complexity takes a lot of time. And in fact, it, it sometimes takes more time than a typical program evaluation to analyze and test the findings, particularly because of the need to look for alternate hypotheses. Uh, I think this is important to mention uh, for people who are commissioning evaluation. You know, speaking from an evaluator's point of view, um, 
it, it, our clients need to be able to provide adequate resources for thorough analysis and build that into the time frame for evaluation studies like this. Um, I think, you know, Mona and I agree that while we did a good job of planning for this, we still wished we had built in a little bit more time to test alternative hypotheses with foundation staff and community members before compiling our final report. Mona, is there anything you'd like to add regarding the lessons learned? Sure. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, so during the strategic review, we also saw the value of being proactive in discussing our findings. And this idea really connects back to the first item listed on the slide that many pr perspectives were taken into account during the design and implementation of the strategic review. And so the findings were intentionally brought back to and discussed with um, internal staff at multiple levels, which was critical and allowed the foundation to determine how to use the information to adjust our work. And we also offered to share case study findings back to communities of focus. Um, when we produced those, those case studies. So I think I can leave it there for now with our lessons. And I believe I'm passing it back to Shriek. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mona and Caitlin. So I'll take on uh, the moderating roles from Hallie for this, this part of the conversation. So one question that's come up, uh, Mona and Chris, is around those evaluation questions. And you mentioned uh, that the evaluation questions stemmed from uh, the assumptions embedded in the project theory of change. So we'd love to hear more about, uh, you know, some practices for identifying those assumptions at the start, because that's not often, you know, uh, mandatory practice uh, from what we've seen. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, when we were on the outset of the strategic review process and thinking about how we would approach the work, like Caitlin mentioned, we went to a number of different stakeholders to try to figure out what were the key questions on the minds of both um, grantees as well as internal staff at TCE. And so where we landed um, was on the questions that we went through earlier, and it really involved taking the time out um, to do that internal uh, reflection as well as to reach out to external partners. And that process um, looked like a team of internal staff at the endowment coming together to take part in the strategic review process overall and thinking through the key partners that we've been working with over time at that moment. Remember that we were three years into building healthy communities, and so um, we thought back to uh, the work that had taken place and our key partners along the way. And so we identified um, different partners for us to go to to um, ask those questions of what is important for us to think about right now. And in the process of working with this internal work group at TCE, we also came to the conclusion that we really wanted to understand um, how our theory of change was unfolding. This is a critical aspect of the work that we are embarking on, um, and we wanted to ultimately test some of those key assumptions around um, how power building um, was evolving, what community capacity building was looking like. So thinking through those questions would allow us to look more deeply at um, elements of our work that are critical to how we think change will occur and um, allow us to consider um, refinements um, that would be necessary. Great, thanks, Mona. And, and there's another question regarding, um, you mentioned a little bit about how you used your grantees as part of this process of sort of co-creating with you. Uh, I'd love to hear more both on the evaluation questions and as well as in terms of using and making sense of the findings. How were grantees involved? Sure. Do you want me to go through that process? Or Caitlin, do you want to take that question? Can you just repeat the question, Shriek? Uh, just how are grantees involved, uh, both in the in the design and you know creating the questions, as well as using the findings uh, and being part of the findings on the back end? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I can use the example of of the the case study work in particular. Um, so, you know, as as Mona and I both mentioned, you know, for for us with the building healthy communities work, the we used information that we had gleaned from some early interviews with grantees during the design of the strategic review. 
um, to inform the questions. Um, when it came to the case studies, we hadn't selected in advance what topics those might be, um, like which communities we were going to be uh, looking at more deeply. Um, and then there was one case study in addition to the two community level case studies that looked at a cross cutting issue that affected both statewide policy change as well as work that was happening um, in, in most of the 14 places, which was the endowments um, work around boys and men of color. Um, and in, in doing those case studies, uh, you know, we were really intentional in engaging people who were both leaders of the work in those places uh, as well as grantees, um, and in fact, I think that was largely driven in part by a desire of, of community members and leaders and residents to be a part of this process and to ensure that the evaluation that we were doing and the case studies that were created really reflected what really um, were sufficient and adequate in reflecting the work that was happening and just the extent to which things had changed, knowing that our evaluation team was you know, a, a set of outsiders who could only, you know, get grasp onto so much context in the time we had. So building those partnerships with the local researchers who um, were intimately involved with the community, who understood the stakeholders and the, the political and the social environment there was extremely valuable and they gave us a lot of insight along the way, um, both in terms of regular check-ins with them, um, sharing initial drafts of the findings and uh, the reports and, and being really open um, to their feedback and their the way that they um, thought about framing the different issues in terms of the areas of progress and the challenges and tensions that we had identified. And I'll add that um, I'll add that the, the last phase of the work once the strategic review was completed and the case studies in particular for the sites that we had focused intentionally on were shared back with, with those sites. And so in one of the sites, we were able to structure um, a conversation within the site that not only um, shared the findings through the strategic review, um, but we also um, teed up a series of, of questions for grantees to actually talk through the findings around so that we could not only share what we were learning through the review, but we could um, really use that as an opportunity to gain some additional insight from grantees as well as to have the findings be discussed by grantees um, so that the information would hopefully be more utilized in, at the site level. In another site, um, they were at a developmental stage where they had gone through um, a lot of changes within their work, and they had decided that um, what would be best to do in terms of using those findings is to have, have it be a centerpiece for celebrating some of the successes and progress that had, they had made in the course of uh, making some course corrections already. So hopefully Great. that gives you a sense of how that information was used. Yeah, well, thank you, Mona, and thank you, Caitlin. So I think this is a good uh, point to bridge to the full panel Q&A. And as a starting point there, uh, I'd actually love to toss it back to both uh, Mona and Chris, uh, the, the funders in the room, and, and ask you, you know, evaluators are always interested in well, what the so what and the now what. So how has the evaluation uh, actually helped you? What changes have you made? How has this helped evolve your thinking about your initiative? Maybe start with Chris. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I think that as a result of, of this experience and our experience with Challenge Scholars, our view of evaluation has become more expansive. It's, it's more than a set of measurable outcomes. And, I, and it should be clear that we are tracking measurable outcomes. For instance, we're looking at attendance, standardized test scores. Um, the evaluation team conducts surveys that, that track students aspirations and so on. So we're tracking a number of measurable outcomes. But, but we're thinking about this more broadly. So we, we really do see the evaluation of challenge scholars as an investment in the initiative. Um, and the, what that is providing us is stronger partnerships, greater effectiveness, more responsiveness, we're increasing our learning, and we're having we're giving, getting more opportunities to inform our community. So I, that 
it's, it, I think it, it has helped change the way that we as a community foundation think about uh, how not only how we evaluate challenge scholars, but some of our other grantees. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, and at the endowment, I think this complexity lens um, is really allowing us to think about how we intentionally approach evaluation from a perspective that's, that's deeply rooted in learning, um, so that we're collecting information with the intention of, of using it um, so that we can refine our work, particularly with this focus on, on feedback loops. Um, I think it's also helping us sharpen the types of questions that we're exploring through our evaluation, evaluation efforts um, so that we're paying specific attention to how and why things may or may not be working, allowing us to, to make refinements along the way. Um, I think the other thing that it's raising for us is that it's, it's really helping us raise some of the tensions of our work. And the tensions that sometimes may not be ultimately solvable, um, but that we're putting attention on these tensions so that we can continue to raise information that allows us to manage, uh, to change, and to adapt. And I think that's really critical um, as we're interested in ensuring that we are continuously improving our work. I think the, the last thing I'll mention around this is um, I think it also calls out, this, this complexity lens really calls out um, the need to have evaluation teams with, with solid skill sets around um, qualitative methods. I think oftentimes when we talk about impact, we're focusing on um, quantitative me methods and, and using them solely, and I think this approach is really showed us that, um, you know, qualitative methods are incredibly um, useful and valuable and needed. In fact, multiple qualitative methods are often needed to triangulate findings. And so ensuring that um, the team that we work with have that as a solid skill set has also been um, really helpful to see. Thank you, Mona. Uh, so there are some questions around, uh, you know, how is this uh, evaluation approach different from things like developmental evaluation or, or utilization-focused evaluation? So uh, maybe, Hallie, you can, you can address that? Sure. Just briefly, I, I think it's a great question. So I think the best way to think about it is to think about evaluating complexity is really a, a lens or you, the complexity lens um, that you want to bring to evaluation work. If, if the intervention or initiative is complex or is in a complex environment, it's a lens you bring, which means then you choose different methods or different ways of being in the community or with the organization and attuning your attention to things that you might not otherwise do. Um, and that's why the nine propositions really are really um, ways of thinking about how to focus one's attention, where to look for, for data, if you will, or the kinds of data you will uh, want to collect using multiple methods. And in our practice brief, we give a, um, suggest a wide variety of methods to, um, that may not be in the traditional evaluator's toolbox. But the complexity lens can be brought to developmental evaluation for certain, can be brought to formative, and can be brought to summative evaluation. So if you think of it as a lens, then it do, it, it's applicable to any kind of evaluation. And I do think at the same time there are certain evaluation approaches that are more um, amenable or more natural kind of um, or symbiotic to a complexity lens, certainly empowerment evaluation, utilization focused evaluation, learning oriented evaluation, those approaches I think are very uh, symbiotic with bringing a complexity lens and probably do so in many ways. I hope that just helps a little bit. Yeah, thanks. I and mean, I just want to pick up on the point about specific methods. There was a question earlier on about, you know, we looked at methods like outcomes harvesting and most significant change. Uh, so I just want to refer folks again to the practice brief. Uh, and towards the end of the brief, we have a table that outlines a set of methods. It's not exhaustive by any means, but a set of tools and methods that are uh, helpful uh, while evaluating complex initiatives. And not to say that, you know, you going to throw out the, the more traditional tried and tested methods like interviews and, and focus groups and surveys, I think they can still be helpful. Uh, but what you seek through those, the kinds of questions you ask, 
you know, what you really look for might be different in the case of complexity initiatives. Uh, another one, Heli, I might throw this back to you as well, is uh, it's about the use of logic models and theory of change, theory of action. Again, two tools that have traditionally helped us in the evaluation field. How do those sit with uh, evaluating complexity? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, well, there's obviously an inherent tension in using a logic model that, you know, on paper looks like it's a linear, kind of mechanistic, predictable, you know, all the outcomes. Um, and what we've just shared with you about complexity, about being adaptive and responsive, and that a lot of times we're working in complex environments where we don't know how things are going to play out over time. Um, so, you know, I think a logic model that is, is extremely useful for engaging people in a conversation about just what they think they're doing and what they're going to accomplish. Um, but I don't think it becomes the roadmap necessarily for evaluating complex initiatives. So I, I will always think a logic model are great discussion tools, great, great at um, surfacing assumptions and understandings about the work and what people think they are trying to achieve. So I think they're fine to have in a loose kind of way, um, but not to imagine that is the map and we're just going to um, you know, go down this road and it's all going to be very knowable and predictable um, uh, you know, in the future. I think that would be uh, you know, misleading. Um, theories of change, very fond of theories of change, again, because I think they help people articulate their assumptions, their mental models about um, how the, what they're expecting, what the work looks like and what they're expecting from the work. Um, but they, I think we can think about developing theories of change and logic models in nonlinear ways as well. So to think about how do we use circles and embedded circles and arrows to kind of show how we think things will unfold within this larger system. So I think these tools are still useful, but we need to adapt them a bit and not rely on them as a map, necessarily, as we think about evaluating complex interventions or initiatives. Thanks, Hallie. Mm -hmm. And there's a question about the role of the evaluator, and maybe, Caitlin, you can speak to this, is what does working this way mean for the role of the evaluator, for example, in, in building trust? And how does it compare to, you know, quote, unquote, traditional ways of the evaluator being ob objective? for instance. Thanks, Tree. Sure, I'll, 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 take a, I'll take a first pass with that one. Um, so the role of evaluator um, in evaluating complex initiatives, uh, like these two examples, I, I think there, there is certainly an importance and primacy to be placed on uh, building trust and, relate, and the relational aspect of evaluation in the context of evaluating complexity. Um, you know, the, the sort of context in which these evaluations take place, as Hallie laid out earlier, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about how the work is unfolding, about what changes are, are resulting from the work that's happening on the ground. There's lots of different stakeholders often who have, uh, have you know, an important stake in the work that, that's taking place. Um, and so there's a sensitivity um, and a, an ability to to build bridges and relationships that I think is is really important um, to bring to the table as an evaluator of of complex initiatives. Um, you know, I think there's also uh, just a sense that in, in all of the both in evaluating the challenge scholars' work and building healthy communities um, that you know as a team we are in constant communication with both uh, the funders and the key partners who they're working with to carry out these initiatives. Um, and Mona mentioned working groups uh, with program staff, for example, with building healthy communities um, as a way to both you know, create an environment that people's voices can be heard and incorporated into the design of the evaluation, but also the ongoing implementation of it um, and, you know, multiple checkpoints throughout the process. So it isn't in any way like, you know, we have a set of questions and then as evaluators we kind of step back and we go away and we collect the data for a series of weeks or months and then, you know, poof, at the end of the project we sort of present a final report to our clients. Um, you know, they're really brought along, um, brought along during the process um, which I think both strengthens the value and relevance of the final report, um, and it also sometimes helps them to get up to speed and get comfortable with some of those tensions that might be surfaced during the evaluation. 
Thank you, Caitlin. Um, so I'm going to throw one back to our two funders. Uh, there are some questions about, you know, how do you internally make the case for this kind of evaluation at your foundation? How do you convince your leadership, your trustees, to invest in, in evaluating with a complexity lens when uh, they may be asking for impact? Chris and Mona? Sure. So um, this is Mona from TCE. So I think, I think the, the way in which we really focused on, on moving forward with the strategic review was in thinking through what information we needed at that particular point in time. We were three years into um, building healthy communities we were interested to find out how things were going, right? We wanted to, to step back and look at our work. Um, we were in this initial phase of our work. And what was really clear, I think, to foundation leadership is that we needed information to help us reflect on how our work was currently evolving and the type of information that would be helpful for us at that point in time was to have information that was actionable, that could help us think about whether or not we were moving in the right direction, how implementation was really looking, so that we could produce information to help us tweak our efforts, right, and refine our efforts. And so an impact evaluation at that moment in time would not have been appropriate. Um, it was really incumbent upon us to um, really think through the type of information that we could generate from an evaluation at that particular moment to help us um, refine our efforts. And that, I think, um, really connected back to our foundation's interest in, in learning as we go through our work. And I think that's, I think that's really um, has been the crux of what made the strategic review the appropriate um, approach for us to take three years into building healthy communities. And I think it will still be um, a useful type of approach to utilize as we continue moving through building healthy communities, given the complexity of the work. Um, it's not to say that we won't be focused on impact um, as we continue down the road, but I think, I think in making the case for this type of approach, it's really critical to think about timing of where um, efforts are at within your foundation and the type of information that would be um, most actionable at that particular moment in time. Great. Chris, quick response? Yeah, I, actually, I would echo uh, everything that Mona said. Uh, it, it, similarly, we were in a position um, three years ahead of where California Endowment was when they began. We were at the very beginning. So uh, we we didn't know where the initiative would go and really what it would what it would look like. So the importance of having a learning partner along on that journey with us was critical. And I give credit to our leadership here at the foundation to understand that that's that was what we needed to do at the time. So it was just very it was it was very timely and appropriate to take this approach. Thanks, Chris. Um, Holly, I'll hand it over to you uh, to take it. So I'm just one question I'll throw out as you uh, do that is, if we want to start taking a complexity lens to our work and, and our evaluation, how do we start? Well, thanks a lot, Craig. <laughs> 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 um, read the nine propositions, and then as you you know think about commissioning or in con engaging in any evaluation, think about answering the questions to the extent to which your um, initiative is complex, and if, if it is, then think about how can you ensure uh, the inclusion of those different propositions into the work. And discuss that with your, your evaluation or your internal staff about how can you capture some of the nine propositions um, that will capture the elements of complexity in your evaluation work. Um, that's a start. That's a short answer. <laughs> so in closing, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. We had um, over 250 participants. It was wonderful. Um, around what makes evaluating complexity different. We hope you've enjoyed the presentation, and we'd like to offer a special thank you to our panelists for today's event, Mona Jawar from the California Endowment, Chris Cutsley from the Grand Rapids Community Foundation, and Shriek and Caitlin from FSG. To continue the conversation on evaluating complexity, we invite you to visit FSG's website, where you can find reports, case studies, and more information on evaluation. 
As a reminder, we ask that you do take a moment and complete the evaluation that will appear momentarily on your screen. Your comments and suggestions are really important to us as they do help us provide um, information to future quality programming. And again, you can find today's PowerPoint slides as well as the Evaluating Complexity Practice Brief on the FSG.org website. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We look forward to continuing the conversation.